Hello and welcome to the Greatest Games Podcast brought to you by 816 Basketball. I'm one of your hosts, Brian Rosefield, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris de Blasio. Hello, Brian, and welcome. For the first time, listeners to the Greatest Games Podcast, this is a chance for us to catch up with basketball coaches from around the country and have them tell us about the greatest games they were a part of. We don't put any limits on them. It could be their time as an assistant coach, a head coach, a B-team coach, CYO coach, AU coach, whatever they want, just whatever game they consider to be the greatest game they were a part of. Well, I'm ready to get started, so let's welcome in our guest for today, Coach Chris Gaskin, who just wrapped up his 18th season as the head boys basketball coach at Ridgefield Park High School in Ridgefield Park, New Jersey. Coach, welcome on in. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. Coach de Blasio, always a pleasure to be part of something with you. Uh, this is awesome. Whatever, what else would anybody like to do during quarantine time and talk hoops? And, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, nobody's going to be too interested in what I have to say, but I sure like to talk to you guys. <laughs> that is untrue, Mr. Gaskin. You are a rising legend in Bergen County coaching. You're rising to the status of legend. You haven't gotten there yet. You're getting close. Yeah. Uh, Listen, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that, except just try to get better every day. That's it. Brian, Chris is a great ambassador of the game. He uh, works with the Bergen County Coaches Association and with the Bergen County Jamboree Committee. And he, 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 like you, is one of those people who's a junkie for it, cares about the game and everything it has to stand for. I always, always love to hear things like that. This is a game that I know for me, and I think all three of us included, is given so much, and so it's nice to be able to give back. No doubt about it. I mean, I found myself a home where I am now uh, in a position that, uh, you know, like I said, 20, 30 years, 28 years ago, I never would have imagined where I, where I am and where I've been. Uh, it's been a pretty great run, and it's all because of that, that damn little ball that we like to put in, between, in, in the net. <laughs> so yeah coach give us uh, your resume as a coach uh my resume i mean i grew up in bergenfield new jersey graduated from bergenfield high school i uh, attended st francis college in loretto pennsylvania from uh 93 uh, 89 to 93 and uh soon after that the first job i ever got out of college was freshman boys basketball coach at richfield park high school um and i did that for a few years my my degree from St. Francis was English and communication. I had no education background, but uh, the AD there uh, told me, look, if you really want to be a, te- uh, a coach full time, you should get certified as a teacher. So in New Jersey, they have the alternate route program. So I went back, I got certified as an English teacher. And then the principal of Richfield Park High School said, you would be a great addition, but we think you should be in special ed. So then I went back and I took six <laughs> more classes in special ed. I got dual certified. And all along the way, I I coached freshmen for eight years. I coached JV for one. And now it's been 18 years coaching varsity. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, I was born a Bergenfield Bear, but I'm going to die a Richfield Park Scarlet. I like that. I like that. I love to hear that. uh, Go ahead. No, and and you're doing the same thing with uh, one of your coaches now, your freshman coach, encouraging him to get his teaching certification so that he continue to be a teacher and a coach. I know that. Yeah, well, you know what, and quite honestly, years ago, there were probably a lot more coaches who were outside the teaching profession, and then for a long time, it became, you know, if if you wanted to be a high school teacher, you had to teach in the building, and I, and I truly believe that there's a lot of advantages there. I mean, Chris, I know you don't work in the building that you uh, coach at, but in a lot of high school settings, there is an advantage to have the coaches of the various sports in the building. But I also think that the way basketball is changing now, AAU is so prominent and uh, travel ball is so prominent. I think there are going to be a lot more coaches who are outside the building going forward as well. So it seems like the trend might be going in the other direction uh, a little bit, depending on the school district. Coach, how valuable was it for you to be able to start out as a freshman coach and work your way up? Like what kind of view is it giving you as a varsity coach and how valuable experience was that for you? Oh, my God. Let me just tell you that. You know, when we're all 23, 24 years old, we think we know everything. And um, my first year coach in freshman basketball, we went one in 18. Um, you know, a couple of the better freshmen got moved right up. I had a kid who was very good, whose father was a maniac in the stands. They loved each other. But during the games, they'd be yelling back and forth at each other. I, I just learned so much how to, how to deal with situations that, you know, 
I, there are a lot of young, younger coaches who think they're ready at 25, 26. I'm so thankful that I didn't become a head coach until I was 30. There were so many valuable lessons I learned through the years. Uh, as not even all X's and O's as far as, you know, having to, you know, keep, keep these kids in line, ha having to uh, just truly make them understand that it's more than just the basketball, that you are a student first and there's certain ways in which you need to act and certain things that you need to accept. Um, and I'm so thankful that I did not become a head coach until I was a little little later than I thought I was ready. At. I, you know, I thought I was ready at 25, 26. And in hindsight now, as a 49-year-old man, I realized, thank God I didn't get it until I got older. <laughs> that's that's what I meant to say there in, in all my jumbled up words. <laughs> All right, Coach, that brings us to our little Q&A segment. We're going to ask you a couple questions here. Um, tell us about your first technical foul you received as a coach. Very funny story. I was an assistant <laughs> coach assistant coach for uh, Dan Morrow, who was a, a gentleman who I consider to be like a second father. And um, I was on the bench. It was in Rutherford, New Jersey, in, in a game as his assistant. And – a guy that I've known for a long time who's an NFL official, Mr. Ed Camp. He's actually a Bergenfield, New Jersey uh, resident at the time, as I was. And I guess uh, as an assistant coach, I should have kept my mouth shut. And I questioned the call, and I got teed. And I learned right then and there, you're just the assistant coach. So keep <laughs> your mouth shut. Uh, that's, a, that's a lesson that uh, many an assistant coach has learned. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so coach. You know, it, it, is a, it is a valuable lesson because I tell you what, I might not even be, I, I don't like my coaching staff. Now I have some assistant coaches who are phenomenal at what they do. And uh, you know, they might be better at X's and O's than I am or, or this and that than I am, but you know what, I'm still the head coach or the assistant coach. And we have to understand that that's the way that's the, that's the, the order. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I know you told us about your journey and your, and your move through the ranks, but your, what really led you to become a high school basketball coach? What was that, that driving force? So, you know, this is, this is how I'm going to give back and become a coach. You know, quite honestly, my father and mother both grew up in the Bronx and one of my father's childhood friends was Kevin Lockery. Kevin Lockery played in the NBA as the head coach of the, the Nets back when we were, when I was very young, when he had Dr. J but then as I started getting a little older through fourth, fifth, sixth grade, he was the coach of the Bulls. He was coach of the Atlanta Hawks. So my father would take me to games and I had the opportunity to meet him. I'd gotten into the locker room a few different times. I was a big autograph hound back then. And it was just something about the game that I really loved. And you know what? Um, I consider myself the classic underachiever as an athlete. I probably had a lot more to give and I didn't. And I look back and I have a lot of regret but there's always been something about the game. And then when I went to college at, in St. Francis, uh, my sophomore year, they made the NCAA tournament led by Mike Isolino from, uh, he was famous with the, uh, the video game. Um, uh, what's that video game uh, that all the years ago, all the teams had two representatives. Uh, NBA Jam. NBA Jams. And, you know, Mike <laughs> was the star at St. Francis. And uh, he had gotten drafted by the Dallas Mavericks. And I worked the whole summer. With, uh, with their camps in the summer. And then Tom McConnell got hired, and he's the women's coach at IUP now, and IUP's women are phenomenal. They made the national championship game two years ago, final four a couple years in a row, and he asked me to come on as a student assistant, and I just helped behind the scenes with so many different things. And so many of the guys from that staff, Jim Christian is the head coach at Boston College right now. John Sano has been the longtime head coach at Bloomsburg College. And it just really became something that I really, truly wanted to be part of. And uh, there, there's a big part of me that wants to coach in college, but I love teaching and coaching in, in, in the high school setting. And uh, it's really been uh, such an amazing run, something I never could have predicted. Awesome. Uh, who is the best player you ever coached against? Ooh, well, the best player in Bergen County, I, I don't know. I, 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 I could break that down. I mean – Corey Raji was phenomenal. Played I forgot about college. Corey. I was thinking of Ahmed and uh, Sandy. Uh, you know, those guys are very good. Uh, I got to say, um, Leonte Carew, who played for the Miami Dolphins, was an outstanding rebounder. He killed mm -hmm. us on the backboard. Um, you know, over the years, you know, we've been pretty lucky. I know uh, in 2011, we lost in the sectional final 
to a team from Newark Central. And I think the whole starting five went D1 off of that team. Um, actually, the kid uh, who was the wide receiver at Arizona State this year, Frank Darby, he played at Lincoln High School in Jersey City. We played against them in high school. Terrific oh, okay. athlete. As far as, though, like my main league, uh, I think Corey Raji was, uh, without a doubt, the best player the, from my main from my league through the years. But there's been some other kids who've certainly made their made their mark on on the D2 D3 level. But Corey did it on the D1 level in the ACC, which I think is pretty darn impressive. Very true. So, coach, with the, I'm a high school athletic director here in South Carolina. So a lot of times I'm having conversations with my coaches about uh, more than wins and losses, and asking them what makes a successful season for them. So I'll ask you that question. How do you define success for you in your role as a head coach with your guys? You know, it's, um, I guess the, like anything else, the older you get, to, you start to see things a little differently. And I really believe, and I, I might have been a John Wooden or somebody else, you know, I'm a big, I like to find quotes. And I think it might have been Coach Wooden who said, you know, at the, your number one goal as a coach uh, isn't always about wins and losses. It's about to make sure that your players are better men, better people at the end of the season or the end of their four-year run in your program. And, and I'm a big believer in that. I believe in uh, accountability. I believe in, you know, trying to push these guys to be uh, student athletes, to try to be better than they are. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, my family, again, grew up uh, with not a lot of money in the South Bronx. And when they moved us to the suburbs, they wanted us to have a better life. And now I think as a teacher and a coach, I really want the kids that I teach and coach to have a better life than I have. So if I have any opportunity to influence them in that manner, you know, I'm definitely going to do it. I love to hear that. And it just echoes a lot of the things that I, again, hear from my coaches and uh, it sounds like your heart's in the right place. I love to hear that. So again, coach, this, uh, podcast is the greatest game so at this point here in the podcast I'd love to hear about the greatest game that you've ever been a part of you can give us as much background information as you'd like and tell us why this game is so special to you um I have quite a few but I mean honestly I mean uh, growing up I never would have envisioned uh winning a state sectional championship as a player or a coach so uh, as much as there's been a few other games that are just as meaningful. I, I just have to say, I guess in 2012, um, we hosted Newark Tech in the uh, North Two Group Two State Sectional Final. Uh, the game was a seven o'clock tip off at 5:15. They had a lot of doors; nobody else could get in. Uh, my family, my father, my brother, some of my really good friends. I had sneaked them in the back door while people started sprinting towards the door, banging on the door, trying to get in. Uh, it was just truly. Uh, amazing to go from one in 22 my first year, you know, about 12, 13 years earlier, to having the gym closed at 5.15 for a 7 p.m. game. Um, you know, winning the game was awesome, but just seeing how far we had come as a program and seeing the community involvement and seeing how crazy it was. And we had great administration who was all about it. Uh, and that night, they actually had invited back. The last time Richfield Park had a state championship team was 1977, and they invited the whole team back, and they sat them in a, a special area. And at halftime, they made a nice presentation for them. And then for us to go win that game, uh, it really it was just an incredible night for me. I think it was an incredible night for everybody involved with it. Um, just I, I could talk about it forever. It's just, uh, you know, you're right. It's not always about win, winning games, but uh, when you can finally get to a, a place where you never thought you'd get to, uh, that's what that's what make that, that makes that night incredibly special to me. And every year on March 6th, I make sure I text all the members of that team just to wish them a happy anniversary. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. I didn't know that you texted all of them. That's great. Take us through the game a little bit. What were your feelings going into the game about the actual game? About the, um, you the, know what? They all... They showed up and they were dunking and, you know, looking in almost incredibly uh, daunting task for us. And uh, we came out on a good run and then they made a run on us. And then second half, we actually, something I'll never forget, we got a steal. They blocked the shot. They called it goaltending and won, something I had never seen before. And their coach was so upset about the 
a goaltend call that he got called for a technical foul. So it became a five-point play. So we went from up six to up 11. We made all the free throws plus the ball on the side, and then we hit a three. So it was a goal 10 and one and a technical foul all on the same play. So it actually was an eight point. It wound up being eight points you got on that whole possession, right? Right, right. Wow. And you know, something that I'll never forget, and on our principal at the time, uh, Mr. Jim Donahue, the next day we received an email from the head coach from Newark Tech, and he, he congratulated us, and he said, I just wanted you to know I've been coaching high school basketball for over 30 years. And besides a game that he had coached in Morgantown, West Virginia, back in like the early 80s, he had never been in a gym with such, a, such an environment like that before. So that was really special. And that was a credit to our administration, our students, our athletic director for really, you know, letting the crowd be into the game and, and, and made it the spectacle that it should be. These kids have worked so hard. Any of these high schools that get to this uh, level, if, if their administration or ADs, no disrespect, Brian, <laughs> are holding the fans back from being part of the game, I got a problem with that. Anything to help these kids win is what should go on. And uh, Richfield Park was great. There wasn't anything disrespectful being said. They were just loud and raucous and making noise. And they made it an incredible environment. And it's certainly a night that I don't think anybody who was part of it will ever forget. Yeah, well, it sounds like just unbelievable playoff basketball. I'm getting chills thinking about it. I love we have a big time event down here. We do with Bojangles and we pack out the gym for three nights. And there's nothing I love more than seeing 1,500 fans in that building just getting excited about high school basketball. So, what was the lead up, the build up to that game? Was it did you win the game the prior to by two or three days, or did you have a week you know to build what? up for? Or? The, the the irony of it was the year before we lost to Newark Central in the final. And we had to play them in the first round this year. And we beat them in the first round. And their coach was like, go win it, go win it. You guys got it. Second round, we played Rutherford. And Rutherford uh, was up one in overtime with five seconds to go. One of the craziest things I've ever seen. Again, one of our players at the time, Corey Bolgetta, he had the most amazing three and a half weeks of basketball of any player I've ever coached. He took a shot from the foul line. It was blocked, and it just went right back into his hands. One dribble got to the rim at the buzzer. The place went crazy. Everybody stormed the floor. You know, it was – and then we had a Saturday night home game against West Essex the next week where, again, close game, and we took off at the end. So we got lucky. There were some upsets along the way that allowed us to have home games throughout. We were the three seed, and the one and the two had gotten knocked off. But that run alone, the Rutherford game – where we scored at the buzzer in the second round to win by one, and then the final to just have a packed, incensed gym an hour and 45 minutes before the game. You know, Chris was at one of my state playoff games this year where we hit a three at the buzzer, and the kids cool. celebrated, and they was, it was such a great game. But as far as, like, the celebration, I, I love my guys now, and I can't wait to get back with them, but the celebration pales in comparison to what, 2012 was like and I keep talking to those guys about that you know next year we want four wins in March not two you have you have uh you have some of the horses to do it you got a great team coming back um you were who was coaching was Gash coaching Rutherford then no uh actually their head coach at the time uh, was Ken Cavanaugh and uh he wasn't at the game he had a death in the family oh, so okay. um his assistant coach was the head coach at the time Coach Gash had been gone already. He might have been in Indian Hills for that one year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just Were they in your league at the time, Rutherford? No, they were not. And we had played them in the Jamboree earlier in the year, and we beat them by 15 in the Jamboree. So, you know, just like playing a team three times in a year, I think anytime you only play a team twice and they're not in your league, you never know what's going to happen there either. It's tough. It is tough. I mean, I'm just thinking of two years ago, I saw Bogota beats uh, Woodridge like a drum in the Jamboree, and then Woodridge came back and beat them at Bogota in the state playoffs. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you talk about uh, – I mean, that's the – as far as, like, chills and environment, but, like, the best individual coaching performance I've seen for any of my players was in 2007. Uh, my best player I've ever coached, a kid by the name of John Tello. We went down to Lincoln in Jersey City, and they had just won the Hudson County Championship. And he went for 32 and 18 in the semifinal round down there uh, to win the game. And it was insane. Our bus driver was told to just drive through the red lights, get out of town as soon as possible. 
you know, because uh, it wasn't it wasn't a safe place for us to be after that. We went out to the bus and there was a bunch of windows broken on the bus, but you know they all respected him. He carried us and uh, and we got out of town as soon as we could. That's great. <laughs> Just drive through the red lights. You gotta love that. Get out of here. Just get out of here. When you see the you... chipping, when you see the when you see the chicken rib crib, don't slow down. <laughs> <laughs> You've told me a lot about that 2012 team and that game and that night. Man, that just sounds like an awesome environment. I mean, I got to experience a little bit of it when I was at Creskill. Um, you know, and I hope, I hope I can create that environment one day at, uh, at Saddlebrook. Yeah, listen, like, hey, Chris, you know, man, I started 1-22 you know, I love what I do, but you know what? You, you got to get the horses. And that starts at a young age. The sooner that, you know, hopefully we can get through this uh, pandemic, everybody gets healthy and we can, you know, start working with the camps and the clinics in town, start building up your own name and your reputation, letting people know that you care about their kids. And little by little, you'll see the same success that I believe yeah. that I've seen in the park. Absolutely. All right, you know, coach. It's, 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 it's the Coach Marty Rivard way. You just got to follow Marty's way. Yeah, put in no, the time he... and effort. Put in the time and effort. You know, you're talking about the most successful coach in Bergen County history. What's he got? About 780 wins when he retired. Yeah. And it was all about the. It was all about summer and defense. Summer camp, getting to know the kids, and then preaching defense. I told him this year I only need to coach 360 more years to catch him. <laughs> he catches win total at the rate at the rate I'm going. <laughs> so you guys got the wrong guy. You wanted a guy to come on and be real short. I, I like to talk. So no, I'm sorry. Oh, but... <laughs> we love talkers. This okay, is uh, this is our final question of the night. What is a phrase or motto or mantra you find yourself repeating, practice after practice, game after game, year after year? What is something that if I ask one of your players? from 2007 and one of your players from 2017, what's something that Coach Gaskin always says? What would it be? Ah, uh, well, I know that I'm, I'm famous for this, you know, the, the waving of the hands. You ask my assistant coaches, they'll say that I used to – I, I always say not for nothing. Like, not for nothing. We could be doing this better. Not for nothing. And it drives them crazy. But, uh, I, you know, I'm sure they could probably give you a better answer. And – uh. I don't know if there's a children listening on here. So um, I'm sure there's some other things that have been said through the years. <laughs> Actually, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. A few years ago, the two of the girls that were doing the book for us, they, uh, they were great kids and they wrote down everything that I said kind of crazy during the year. They wrote it down. And at graduation, they came over to me and they gave me like this 10 page pamphlet with everything typed up. And uh, there were some pretty interesting things said, but the most important thing, and, and I'll go with this, a couple of the alumni parents have always said to me, they go, it, it amazes me how, uh, how many kids from the past come back to the games, come over to see you, give you a hug, and this and that. I might be, you know, I might be a jerk at times, and I'm not supposed to be your friend, but I guarantee that after you graduate, if I can ever do anything to help you, I will. I want to continue to build those relationships because I know that there's times where I'm very tough on these guys where I hold them very accountable and maybe they're not happy, but my job is to try to make them better players, better people. And, and that's what I try to do. Well, I tell you, I, I, I love to hear that. Just that, that vision of having kids come back and want to be around you. Like I, I've had kids in the past that have come up to me in similar ways. I used to run my kids. And I was really hard on them, but I've literally had kids come up and say that was the most valuable time of my life. And that sounds like that's what you've been able to create in your career there. You know what, Brian, that's what it's all about. And for, for, for a young guy like Chris who's just getting started and anybody else, like, again, I, I see things so much differently now at, at 49 years old compared to when I was 23. When I was 23, I just wanted to win games. Now, if you tell me that we're going to go 10 and 18, but uh, five seniors on that team are going to go to college, graduate, be great fathers, husbands, successful people, and give back to their community, I'll sign up for that as well. Uh, I, I love it, Coach. I just can't thank you enough for for coming on. It's been fantastic to get to know you here on this platform, hear about your greatest game, and and hearing your answers to these questions. And just can't thank you enough for for coming on tonight. Well, thank you, Brian. I wish you guys all the best. I mean, this is always a great thing. I, I getting involved anytime, talking hoops with anybody, and you know, uh, I'm sure you're going to find many other guests with some great things. So I wish you guys all the best with this new endeavor.
Well, Coach, thanks so thank much you. again. And uh, for my co-host, Chris de Blasio, I'm Brian Rosefield, and thank you for listening to this episode of The Greatest Games. Thank you.